The words of Isaiah impacted Nephi so much that he committed himself to the painstaking task of recording much of it to the plates in his possession. Though the words of Isaiah may at times feel like a coded language, there is an opportunity for all to understand his teachings through the workings of the Holy Spirit. And while his words will take prayer and effort to understand, the message of Isaiah's words will not. Jesus Christ is the Redeemer of all mankind, and the plan of our Father in heaven is one of grace, justice, power, and mercy. I invite you to join us today as we study 2 Nephi chapters 11 through 19 of the Book of Mormon and encourage each of us to seek divine inspiration. Welcome to Come Follow Up. The first time I read the words of Isaiah, I was so confused, so lost. I remember I didn't understand a thing. Like trying to read hieroglyphics. It was like reading a different language. <laughs> now I feel like I understand better because I try to focus on what it's speaking to my heart. Every time I, I read Isaiah, I like to come with a question in mind. And that just really helped me to better understand his words as I focus on that because it lets the spirit really know what it is I'm, I'm looking for and it can give me the answers that I need. Since I've begun to read Isaiah in little smaller sections and really look for the poetry and look for the feeling and the themes that are coming through, they've come alive to me. I've seen God's hand and I've come to know the nature of God way better because of the words of Isaiah. Welcome everyone to our discussion on 2 Nephi chapters 11 through 19 of the Book of Mormon. My name is Ben Lomu and I am your host. Our gospel scholar for today is Lynn Hilton Wilson. Dr. Wilson is a former adjunct professor at BYU and was an institute teacher for over 20 years. She is the co-founder and an active participant in Scriptures Central, the expansion of the Book of Mormon Central, and is the author of several books and articles on the Scriptures. Lynn, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. And seated next to Lynn is our special guest, Michael J. Fear. Mike earned his master's degree in religious education from BYU and has spent his life teaching the gospel. He's an author, YouTube creator, and the host of the Faith Coach podcast. He and his wife, Divina, have four children and live in Clover, South Carolina. Mike, welcome. It's great to be here, Ben. Thank you. We're also joined by our studio audience. Thank you all for being here today. Our discussions today are built around the scriptures and complemented by the resource, Come Follow Me. Additional study and teaching material is available at byutv.org slash come follow up. All right, Lynn, I'm going to turn to you to give us a little background. We're jumping into some pretty heavy chapters here. Can you tell us what's going on within 2 Nephi chapters 11 through 19? Nephi says, I love Isaiah, and I want to talk about Isaiah because he saw Christ. And I saw Christ, and Jacob saw Christ. So we have three witnesses for Christ. And then he goes on, he says, my soul delighteth in Christ. I just want to focus on Isaiah because Isaiah focuses on Christ. Lynn, our first topic is how can I better understand the teachings of Isaiah, specific to chapter 11? What does Nephi want us to know? Well, I think chapter 11, Nephi tells you the theme of why he's going to then quote these next several chapters okay. of Isaiah. So it's really helpful. In addition to the three witnesses, that's verses 2 and 3, Jacob, Isaiah, and Nephi have all seen the Lord. Verse 4, my soul delighteth in proving to my people the truth of the coming to Christ. He loves Isaiah because Isaiah takes him to Christ. And, you know, <laughs> the whole Old Testament long, we get more on Christ in Isaiah than we do almost the entire Old Testament combined. You know, it's every 1.9 verses, I think, there's an average name for the Lord. These are all messianic chapters. They're fabulous witnesses that our Savior's coming. I love it. Yeah. Mike, what has been your experience with the book of Isaiah? And was there a point that you could say that his words became a delight? Mm. Yes, that there Good sure question. is. Yeah. I have been studying the scriptures from the time I was a teenager. And I love the Book of Mormon, but Isaiah was kind of one of those ones where there were maybe one or two verses <laughs> I had marked, but I'm reading through, I'm seeing these big names, and I'm like, okay, I'm really not getting it. But it was several years ago, one of my friends suggested to me that the deliverance, that word is in the very first chapter of 1 Nephi, 1 Nephi 20, he says, I will show you that the covenants of the Lord and the power of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even unto the power of deliverance. 
And when my friends shared that with me, I began to study the Book of Mormon looking for deliverance, ways that the Lord delivers. And I'll have to tell you, it was going great and I was seeing it in all of First and Second Nephi. But when I got to the Isaiah chapters, these are stories about redemption and deliverance and salvation. And they just started speaking to me on a very deep and personal level. And then I started thinking back on my own life, where has Christ delivered me? And I just saw it. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear from the audience. What challenges do you encounter as you read the words of Isaiah? Marcellus. I remember when I first joined the church, reading the scriptures was like reading a new language. And then getting to Isaiah, it was like trying to decode the new language that I didn't already know. <laughs> and right. so it was just very hard to mm -hmm. connect with the scriptures and to feel like there was a message in them for me. It just felt like, you know, it was stories of people, ancient people in the past that went through struggles. Mm -hmm. But it was when I learned that there are, are many similarities between us and some of the Israelites and the ways that we can connect with our Heavenly Father that the that kind of fog went away and I was able to understand those teachings better. Marcellus, what role do you think the Holy Ghost played in helping you better understand the words of Isaiah? I think it was when I decided to rely on the Holy Ghost and not rely on myself to find those answers that the Holy Ghost was able to, it was almost like words were jumping off the page and that I was able to see the connections that, you know, these were the struggles that the people, that the Israelites faced mm -hmm. in that. You know, my struggle may not be exactly like that, but I have a similar struggle. That's great. I saw in verse eight where he says, I have written these words that whoso of my people may see these words, may lift up their hearts and rejoice for all men. This is a universal message that God loves his children. Mm -hmm. God loves Israel. That no matter where they've been, how far they've sunken, how, what a mess their life might be or their nation might be, that there's hope. And Isaiah continues to go back to that message of hope every single time. Even as he's saying, I'm gonna destroy you and all these bad things are gonna happen. And then the light will break forth. And then these good things. And then I'll wash away the filth. And then come, re let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. And so the Lord is giving hope throughout Isaiah. And I think Nephi sees the hope. He looks beyond all of the things that maybe confuse us and sees that thread of hope going through every single part of Isaiah's writings. And it's always hope in Christ's it is. deliverance. He is the hope. Yeah. He is yeah. the it's Redeemer, the Deliverer. It's always back to Christ. You know, we see a, a phrase or a couple words that he repeats here that he used when talking about when he was teaching his brothers okay. and how he taught them the words of Isaiah. Um, and he said, and I liken the scriptures, you know, yes. so they can understand. He says that again in verse eight. Ye may liken them unto you. What is he trying to teach us by telling us to liken the scriptures, specifically Isaiah, so that we can better understand them? Well, especially this chunk is about us because I think the destruction of Jerusalem was just a type or like a cookie cutter okay. of the last days. And so by learning there, hopefully we can avoid some of the challenges of the destructions in the last days. But he says, you won't understand Isaiah until the last days. And then he defines what last days means. And he says, it's when the Book of Mormon is going to come to pass to my brethren again. When the small plates, when, you know, he doesn't have anything, whether there's small plates at that time. But I feel like the Book of Mormon, um, Isaiah chapters are to prepare us for Christ's second coming. Mike, give us a little, from your experience, how, how do you look at the book of Isaiah as a, a personal way for you to get your life in, in, in line, get your life in order so that you feel like you are ready for when Christ returns? For me, as I've broken up Isaiah, one of the things that has helped me tremendously over the years is studying in small pieces. Isaiah is poetry. Mm -hmm. I only read Isaiah from paragraph marker to paragraph marker. And I say, that's a poem. So some of them, like Isaiah 1, I think has seven or eight poems in it. As I read each poem, each poem makes sense to me, but this mosaic comes into place. And the mosaic that has come into place for me has been, I'm here for my people. I know where you've been and I know your sins. And I love you and I will deliver you from your sins and from everything else. Because of the personal nature of the things that Isaiah say, I have felt God more personally in my life. It's a very emotional book. And for me, my emotions have been soothed a lot um, because I know the way that God feels about his children. And they've did a lot of really messy things. And the Lord's like, I got your back still. 
I think sometimes there can be a tendency to rush through the book of Isaiah. And yes. there was a question that came through from one of our viewers. You kind of answered the question beforehand, but let's watch it and let's see if we can break it down a little bit further. Sure. Okay, good. Hello, my name is Carson Gilbert. I'm from Royal City, Washington. As I was studying in 2 Nephi chapter 15 this week, these words stood out to me. Woe unto them that say, let him make speed, hasten his work, that we may see it. I am accustomed to things being automatic, and if something takes too long to load, I become frustrated. How can I slow down my temporal eyes to see God and Jesus' work more deeply as they truly are? I really feel like starting the day in prayer, in my scriptures, allows me then to focus the whole day in that same perspective. And then I can look for God in everything throughout the day. And I think that's a wonderful idea. How do I slow down my temporal perspective mm -hmm. in order to focus on Christ? To me, it's our baptismal covenant. It's our sacramental covenant. You know, it's the idea of he is the most important one that we're working for. I may have another job that gives me a paycheck, but I work for, for God. I am Christ's servant. I put on his jersey. I'm on his team mm -hmm. and I want to keep myself focused on him. Yeah. Mike? That's beautiful. I love that. I've struggled a lot of my life with self-criticism. I may, maybe I'm the only one, but it, it is very easy. <laughs> yeah. You're to, not alone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is easy to give other people a break, to, to see the innocence in their actions, but sometimes I'm critical of my own. And for me, at least as I study Isaiah, I see the Lord being so patient with Israel. He's slow with Israel. Because, because he repeats over and over, almost every chapter, some message of hope, of it's okay, we're gonna get through this, we're gonna overcome together. And for me, that's helped me to see this merciful God speaking in Isaiah. I feel like I can give myself more grace, honestly, because of Isaiah's words, because of the hope that's there. Thank you. Lynn, you had earlier mentioned uh, chapter 25 yeah. of Isaiah, kind of the end of the, these chapters. Nephi does give us some, some great advice. Can we go jump to those uh, chapter yeah, 25? Look and, at that commentary well, yeah, there. Yeah, I'd love to break that down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, this is fabulous. Chapter 25, verse four. Hearken, O my people, which are the house of Israel, and give ear to my words, because the words of Isaiah are not plain unto you. <laughs> Understatement of the Book of Mormon, right, right there. Like, you're just uh, not quite yeah, getting yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, they are plain unto those who are filled with the spirit of prophecy. John the Revelator in the book of Revelation also says, if you have the spirit of prophecy, you are a prophet. And the spirit of prophecy is wow. a testimony of Christ. So I again say the way we understand Isaiah is to look for Christ in the text. And then if we pray for it and ask for it and humble ourselves, I think we can receive the spirit of prophecy to understand the book. Yeah. Just to, to go along with that, the writings about Jesus in here mm -hmm. are so tender to me. Talking about a mom with its little baby. Mm -hmm. Talking about a, a husband and wife who have kind of split up and there's some animosity and they want to get back together again. I mean, those are real life situations and real life things that happen. And yet Isaiah treats them so tenderly from the Savior's perspective. Yeah. In just this, this role of Jesus as a healer and as a bridger of the gap and a, a deliverer from this estranged situation. We talk about the atonement, at one minute, this idea of reconciling us to God. That's all throughout Isaiah. And I've read, when I was reading about deliverance in here, I thought, how are these people gonna get delivered? They're a mess. And then the very next little section is about the way that he's gonna deliver them. And it's just repeated over and over. And that story becomes something that has given me great hope. Yeah. What's beautiful about Isaiah is that he, his words are full of prophecies. And the Nephi tells us in chapter 25, verse four, that if you understand them, you have to have the spirit of prophecy. Uh, there's a beautiful quote by uh, Dallin H. Oaks that kind of brings that all together. He said, the book of Isaiah contains numerous prophecies that seem to have multiple fulfillments, 
One seems to involve the people of Isaiah's day or the circumstances of the next generation. Another meaning, often symbolic, seems to refer to events in the meridian of time when Jerusalem was destroyed and her people scattered after the crucifixion of the Son of God. Still another meaning or fulfillment of the same prophecy seems to relate to the events attending the second coming of the Savior. The fact that many of these prophecies can have multiple meanings underscores the importance of our seeking revelation from the Holy Ghost to help us interpret them. As Nephi says, the words of Isaiah are plain unto all those that are filled with the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much for commenting on this first topic of how we can better understand Isaiah. I'm sure we're going to dive into this a little more during footnotes, but this has been a wonderful conversation so far. And for the audience, thank you so much as well for sharing your thoughts. And for those at home, how do you seek to better understand the teachings of Isaiah? Share with us on any of our social media platforms. Christ has been my personal redeemer as he's healed me from my sins and strengthened me in my weaknesses and my shortcomings. Knowing that Jesus Christ died for my sins has helped me get through the day to day. Just remembering and knowing that I can always try again. I remember being in the MTC and seeing a picture of Christ breaking the sacrament and that just opened my heart to know that He really has taken my sins and that He's redeemed me so that I can be clean once again to return with my Heavenly Father. Every time I think about Christ as my Redeemer, I think about the moment when my mom was passing away and how much I needed the Lord and how much He gave me strength. I have lots of things that I need to work on personally and um, as I've given those burdens to Him, He's made me whole and redeemed me. The second topic we're gonna to be discussing right now is Jesus Christ will redeem His people. So we're gonna really get into the heart of these Isaiah chapters. Lynn, what, can you, uh, what sort of context can you provide as to what Isaiah is speaking about? You know, he starts in um, quoting this chapter 12, or Isaiah 2, about the mountain of the Lord's house will be revealed. And then he goes on to the millennium. And then he gives us several chapters on this covenant going corrupt. And um, sometimes people used to call it the pride cycle. But I really like um, Carrie Muelstein's idea of a corrupt covenant because these are God's people. These are the daughters of Zion that are falling. And the Lord keeps teaching them and teaching them. He's a master teacher. He's a gardener. He's pruning them so that they can grow better fruit. You know, it's just beautiful. And then in chapter 19, we get these beautiful prophecies that for unto us a child is born, mm -hmm. unto us the son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. You know, there in again, Handel's Messiah. But we see Christ in each chapter as the one who will come and deliver us. But mainly, I think the emphasis on all the aspects of Christ's atonement is the redemptive nature of Christ in these chapters. All right, well, I'm excited to, to dive in and look at these a little closer. I wanna start in chapter 12 and uh, look at a couple of things that Isaiah is saying and how that relates to redemption and how we can re relate it to ourselves today. Starting in verse two, he says, and it shall come to pass in the last days when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. In verse three, the same thing again, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God. Mm -hmm. What do we see as far as the term mountain of the Lord? What is he referring to? How do you guys read this? The thought that I had about the mountain of the Lord is Moses and Mount Sinai. This oh, is kind perfect. of the, the prototypical mountain where Israel, the gathering of Israel in Moses' day was leading them out of Egypt mm -hmm. or repentance, leading them through the waters of the Red Sea or baptism and up to the mountain of the Lord or to the temple. And so there's this pattern yeah. of gathering that was, was going on in the time. And so Nephi is seeing himself being scattered out to an island of the sea as far as they know. Yeah. And he's envisioning and he sees in the last days his children being gathered in to the mountain of the Lord and the renewal of the covenant, the renewal yeah. of the ties that these covenant people have, even though they've been scattered and lost and forgotten, the Lord says, I haven't forgotten you and I'm gonna re-invite you up to my mountain. And you know, Nephi had a tabernacle 
The yes. tent of my father is, means the tabernacle of my father. This is where they went, scriptures. This is where their marriages were. This is where they came yes. and worshiped. And now, by the time Nephi is writing this part of the plates, they probably have built their temple. Yes. in the land of Nephi. And so this is very important. And I also loved when you said Mount Sinai to think of the Sermon on the Mount, yes. that Christ is there teaching temple doctrines. He will teach us of his ways teach us and of we his will way. walk in his paths. Yeah. The higher law came from a higher place. Yeah. Okay, so I love that phrase that you just said, Mike, about when we go up to the mountain of the Lord or, or the, to the temples, we do learn of his ways, we, we walk in his paths. So, Bringing it back now to modern times, how has going to the house of the Lord, worshiping in the house of the Lord, taught you in his ways and helped you walk on his path? For me, the temple in the last few years has just become incredibly personal. Seeing Jesus way more in the temple than I ever did before in my life. Mm -hmm. All of it, if there's a scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants that says that uh, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. And so that makes me think, if I watch the ordinances and think about the ordinances that we do, I'm going to learn about who our heavenly parents are. Mm -hmm. And we do that in the temple. All of the parts of the temple and the ordinances, all of that is Jesus helping us and facilitating the redemptive power of this life that involves faith, repentance, and these ordinances. But line upon line, coming back into the presence of God is what the temple's about. That's really what the mountain of the Lord is. And that has helped me so much to just feel that personal connection with heaven as I go to the temple and that Jesus is the one that makes that possible. I think Nephi includes Isaiah here <laughs> about the mountain of the Lord's house right before he talks about his experience with entering into the presence of the Lord when he has the vision of the throne. And I see that the idea yes. of the temple taking us to God is probably one reason why the scriptures are organized in this pattern, is to have that following this beautiful introduction. So what about from the audience? How has going up to the mountain of the Lord helped you to walk in his paths? Valeria. Serving a mission, I lost my mother. And I find the temple of the Lord uh, a place of refuge. I actually was able to understand the plan of salvation just a little bit. And I find that to be my place of, um, of order in my personal life. Valeria, how does the Lord use the Holy Ghost to help you know that He is mindful of you? It has taken me years, and I'm still learning as time goes on. But I can tell when the Lord tells me no means no, and yes means yes. And I can differentiate that. Um, I have also learned that when I have not listened to the Spirit, I know when the Lord has not been completely pleased, but yet He's merciful and allowed me to redo or relearn again. Well, Lady, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that part of your life with us. His whole work and His glory is to bring us back into His presence. And we have temples on earth. We have His, He sent His Son to help us, to redeem us. And we, we see this, if we want to jump to, cha uh, to chapter 19, yeah. we see this part as we transition to the role of the Son of God in the redemption. Can we go there and just read us some of those yeah. verses? Yeah. yeah, this is just powerful. When we first start in this messianic prophecy, he says, in the past, sometimes Galilee has received a few spankings kind okay. of thing, you know. <laughs> but then he says in, in verse two, the people that walked in darkness shall see a great light and they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death unto upon them will the light shineth. You know, I think this is talking about the redemption of Christ mm -hmm. coming. And then in verse three, this is my favorite. And thou hast multiplied the nations and increased the joy and the joy before according to the joy in the harvest that the men rejoice as they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden. It's Christ caring for our sins. The burden of having our sins is so bad. I, I think that when the prophet asks us to daily repent, um, I thought it would be hard. It's a joy. Yeah. It's an absolute yeah. joy. I feel happier. I feel mm -hmm. so much better when I can apply these verses because he's already broken this yoke. And just let it go. Just turn back around. Come to the Savior. 
I think the transformation, because sometimes we think redemption is about like getting somewhere. I've said for years, you know, the purpose of life is to go back to our Heavenly Father. That's why we're here. And I've said to my students, I said, if the purpose is to go back and, and have that address, why do you believe in the first place? Because it was already on our business card as a spirit. The purpose is much broader than that. It's the transformation and the growing up. Mm -hmm. Paul uses the phrase, growing up into him, into Christ. We're growing up. We are infant children in a eternal sense that are growing up. And we have these nurturing heavenly parents who help us to see the light, who know we're gonna go through growing pains. And yet the, what the Savior does is he facilitates every single growth. He's the one that heals us and he is the connecting points along every step as we grow up into what our heavenly parents know that we can someday become. And that's why he says in verse 12, but his hand is stretched out still. Yes. You know, I one time, I think there are five times in our section that re repeat this phrase, his hand is stretched out still. So one time I counted them up throughout all four standard works, hand is stretched out, arm is stretched out, and about 50% were in mercy, and 50% were carrying out justice. And I thought, Interesting. justice though is merciful. And when it's from God, it's, it's all for our good. It's all the redemptive nature of our Savior. So even though he's saying here, his anger is not turned away, his hand is stretched out still, I still feel when God is administering the correction I feel loved. So uh, I wanna go back to verse six, and there's a few names that we get in verse six. Yeah. Is there one that, uh, as you read it, I want you to think about, is there one that has special meaning or stands out to you? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All of these are powerful, but the one that stuck out this last time as I was reading it right now with yeah. you is um, that he came as a child. I think it's meaningful to me because I used to work in labor and delivery. I have delivered children and I had seven of my own. There is something so wonderful about our Savior coming to earth and being one of us. And there is something so uniting about the ability to have a God who walked from crawling all the way to his death in our path. And um, he's approachable. He understands us. I, I think the atonement is so believable in my heart because I know he, he lived, he began as a child. The word son spoke out to me because I have four children and our first was a son. And as I've seen him grow up, I think Honestly, I think we're in a, this is a tutorial, how to love like God does, <laughs> how to see everything about a, per a person, to see all their stumbles, to see all of their mistakes, to see all their fallen, to see all the struggles, and yet look beyond all of them to the value and, and the eternal beauty of that soul. And I, I, the Savior did that so well in his ministry. He does that so well with me and allows me to see the value and the eternal beauty of the man that I am and someday I'm gonna become and I'm in the process of growing up into that. And when I think about the Savior tutoring me, the Savior's like, I'll, I'll guide you with the Holy Ghost and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the promptings, I'll nudge you. I wanna tutor you how to grow up into me someday. Yeah. You know, and it's beautiful because Isaiah, who is quoted more than any other prophet in all of the scriptures, if he was our tutor, what would he focus on the most? On that of Jesus Christ. Yes. President Hinckley has a beautiful testimony focusing on Christ. And he says, but of all the things for which I feel grateful this morning, one stands out preeminently. That is a living testimony of Jesus Christ the Son of the Almighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Holy One. I love this part. Jesus is my friend. He is my exemplar. He is my healer. He is my leader. He is my Savior and my Redeemer. He is my God and my King. It's how beautiful the words of Isaiah that we can get that same feeling as he focuses on Christ, that same beauty, that same emotion 
comes out. Thank you both so much for sharing your thoughts and your testimonies in that spirit with us. And for the audience, thank you so much for being here and for sharing with us your spirit as well. And for those of you at home, we still have much to cover in footnotes. Please stay with us. I think the spirit really communicates with me through the scriptures and prayer. The spirit communicates with me through prayers, through people's testimony, through the service that I do. I feel like hymns come to my mind um, in specific moments with the words that I need to think or that I need to feel at that moment. Because of some uh, trauma as a young man, and I, f I felt very much that my heart was closed off from the Lord. And I had an experience where I was filled with the love of God and felt that my heart broke and that what, what was replaced by the pain was the peace of Jesus Christ and the love of God that flowed through me. And the Spirit continues to speak to me that way through that, those tender feelings that I had when my heart broke and when I first felt the Savior's transforming love inside of me. Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. We've dismissed our studio audience and are looking forward to building upon our previous discussions from 2 Nephi chapters 11 through 19 with Lynn and Mike. Okay, so we've really focused primarily on chapter 11, 12, 19 so far. Are you okay if we jump back in and cover the middle chapters? Yeah, it's sequential, yeah, are we okay going in order? That's great. great. Let's okay, do it. Lynn, do you wanna start us off in chapter 13? There's so many messages within chapters 13, 14, 15 about this chaos or this breaking of the covenant, but the verses that are really touching to me Starting in chapter 13, verse 16, I want to read. Moreover, the Lord saith, Because the daughter of Zion are haughty, they walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a tinkling with their feet, they have developed an appetite for things that are not of God. And they're, they're daughters of Zion. I mean, these are women of the covenant or else yeah. children of the covenant. You could obviously, you know, for me and, and Mike reading this, there are definite applications we can be like, yeah, there are some things that I, should, I could learn from this verse maybe. as well. Yeah, yeah, maybe, I think so. Well, I think it's about them putting their trust in whatever it is, in, in uh, their things, other than, putting their trust away yeah. from the Lord. Yeah. And, and he has already in chapter 12 talked about their high mountains and they're lifted up in their fence cities and their walls and their loftiness yeah. and all of their male dominated Thanks. You know, we're, we're a yeah. tough army. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. so good and we have great leaders and we love this thing. And then he's like, I'm gonna take all that away. And, and then he goes here. And, and look at verse 18. And the day of the Lord will take away the bravery yep. of their tinkling ornaments. So do we feel self-confident if we have our ornaments in place? He is saying all these chains and bracelets and mufflers and you know, just change the old English to our day and age and it fits perfectly. This is a prophecy for our day and age. And yet he says, I'm gonna get rid of all of it. I'm taking it all away and verse 24, it shall come to pass. Instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. And he goes on and just talks about the destruction that's gonna come, this chaos, this, the breaking of the covenant is a disaster. And I think that happens in individual lives as well as in nations. Oh, where definitely. We, things yeah. just be, we lose everything. We fall into ruin. And I'm, I've been fascinated with this. As I studied through looking for deliverance in this, mm -hmm. I saw where it says, 25, thy men shall fall by the sword and they're mighty in war. And then this idea of Israel being, having lost everything and sitting on the ground. And how do you come back from that? Yeah. How do you come back when the city's burnt, the men are dead and the women have been carried off and you have this remnant of people left that have nothing. And, and here it is, verse one of chapter 14. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. And if you think about scattered Israel, and you think if Israel is the woman represented here that's desolate and laying on the ground, and the word seven is kind of this complete total number. Israel in their scattering edition has only one man to turn to and that's Jesus Christ. And what are they asking for? They're also making a bargain saying, we're not gonna ask from anything from you. We'll feed ourselves, we'll take care of ourselves, but can we have your name again? Wow. 
can we come yeah. home? Yeah. There's a desperation there. There's a, how, how can we come back? It reminds me of Jacob 4, where the, Jacob asked the question, how can the Jews who rejected the sure foundation ever build upon it so that it can become the head of the corner? And then he, and he gives says, the answer. I'll tell you, <laughs> it's about the Lord's going to work with them and the true fruit is going to come eventually. But that's the same question. How is it possible? It's the same thing that Enos asked. How is it possible, Lord, that my sins are forgiven? Do you understand what I did? And he goes, yeah, it's because of your faith in Christ, whom you've never before seen or heard. Go to, your faith has made you whole. And I, I think that's the message to Israel here. You say, can we come home? Can we come back? And, and look at the very next verses here. In that day, when they turn to the Savior, shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth excellent and comely to them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that they that are left in Zion and remain in Jerusalem shall be called holy. Everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion yes. and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount mm -hmm. Zion and upon her assemblies, a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flame of fire by night for upon all the glory of Zion shall be a defense and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and covert from storm and from rain. That's the savior. He is the covert. He is the tabernacle. He's our hope. He is the one that, in which we can rest. And every dwelling place is our, our our homes, whether it's an apartment or a hut or a tent, you know, yeah. our dwelling places can have the smoke by day and the pillar. Um, what does that mean? And the, the shining smoke? flame. Well, smoke in, in the book of Psalms is prayers. And remember in the incense altar mm -hmm. has to be running 24 seven. It's, it's the prayers ascending to God. Um, and so our, our homes are going to be these, our, each of our dwelling places is where it's going to be a place of prayer. It's going to be a place where the spirit of God is shining at night as the Shekinah in the Old Testament. You know, it's such a beautiful image. And I think Nephi is also saying we are no longer in Jerusalem and yet we can still have this. I, I love the fact that he includes this chapter. Isn't that the vision of President Nelson when he put come follow me in place in the first place? Yeah, yeah. That yeah. every That's home right. would be a place of revelation. Gospel-centered homes. Every, yeah. what does he say? Every dwelling place and every assembly or every congregation. Yeah, yeah. That the spirit of the Lord would rest down upon every dwelling place. What a beautiful thought. And it's very international because look at chapter 15. Yes. He then gives the parable of the olive tree. You know, it's the vineyard here. It's not quite as extensive as Jacob chapter five, but um, second Nephi 15 gives this beautiful Isaiah song of the vineyard and coming from a time where the chosen people were just Israelites or maybe just people in the Southern tribes mm -hmm. because the Northern tribes are just about to be taken away because of their apostasy. <laughs> uh, but my heart says, this is so beautiful as the Lord gives this again, the theme of redemption. Not but, just for a certain group, but for yes. all. Yes. Yeah, his vineyard is so extensive. Yeah. It's the world. Yeah. It's the world. It's great. And then of course it follows by all these woes. <laughs> Look at verse eight, woe, verse 11, woe, you know, all these things. And as I read these woes, we fall into that same trap. It's just tragic. What do you think it means when it says they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst? I think it's yeah. Amos. What does it talk about the, the famine, not of oh, bread and yes. water, but of hearing the word, the word of, God. of God. This idea of you've separated yourself from the Savior you know, and, we're and living you're in a hungry. time where there's more knowledge than there ever has been available yes. at our fingertips. I, I don't necessarily think we have more knowledge, but at our fingertips, we have more knowledge available. And yet we do not... We are in a famine of hearing the, and obeying the word right. of God. Yeah. And part of it is verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, and bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. A symptom of that is the confusing and, and putting everything, not knowing what's up and what's down. When you talk about oh, the relevancy culture. today, right? Yes. Oh yeah, our culture has completely yeah. put upside down. And I just have to constantly rely on the word of God, whether mm -hmm. it's from our prophet or from these words here to, to remind myself where 
true north is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you see God's pattern in the confusion. Look in verse 26. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from afar and will hiss unto them from the ends of the earth. And they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber or sleep, neither the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. He says, I am going to gather these people back home. That's, mm-hmm. that's the hope is that when we've lost things, the Lord's like, that's okay. It's not lost. It's not forever gone. Mm-hmm. Nobody's lost everything. You might think you've lost everything, but that's your appearance. I see God says from a broader perspective. Yeah, yeah. we're I'm constantly having home. to zoom out. And I used to yes. think, just take a bird's eye view. But now I think, no, you have to take a galactic view. You mm-hmm. know, it, For sure. if it's not eternal, it's not important. Okay. You know? So as we, as we talk about how this is very relevant to today, we all have children. What are some of the things that you do, Mike, that you do you, or have done and can, what can plan on continuing to doing to raise your children to be able to see some of the things that Isaiah is warning us against? I have phenomenal kids, so that helps in part, but I really feel like um, family scripture study every day allowed them to internalize on their own because the spirit could work with them individually so that it was their understanding by a very, very early age. Then that's too simple. How could it possibly work? (laughs) (laughs) Right, isn't it right? Like that, that's the beautiful, beautiful answer because you're right. Just, I love that family scripture study. Well, and it starts as family, but then I had, they had to start reading on their own at eight as well. You know I mean? Would do a little bit, but I wanted them to read as soon as they could read well enough Mm -hmm. to understand. But um, what do you do, Mike? One of the things my wife and I have done is, and my wife has set the pattern for this, is listening to and respecting our children. I think God does that for Israel. And I think when someone feels respected and listened to, when they get in trouble, Israel goes back to God. When my children get in trouble, they know that they can come to my wife and I mm-hmm. because we love them. And even when the, the wall gets torn down and things crumble in somebody's life, they're knowing that there is a safe harbor to come to. And, and that takes years to mm-hmm. develop that and to build trust. that trust. But for us, that has been our most successful thing. And it, we don't have perfect children by any means, nor do we have no problems in our family. But respecting, listening to, and seeing the innocence of and the goodness and the eternal beauty of our children has made a tremendous difference. I think that's the way that God deals with us. And I think in chapter 16, he takes us to see yes. another vision that I think really helps in our, in our relationships with humanity, whether it's in our own family or in a calling or neighborhood or community, whatever, because he's saying it's not just about this earthly problems. I'm gonna give you a view of heaven. You know, he steps back and gives us a view of heaven. And I think if we can take our kids sometimes out of all the challenges of peer pressure and let them step back and and see the glory of God. And again, it goes back to the redemption. But this is a vision of the throne. And this is chapter 16, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So the train is this beautiful piece of clothing, and, and it's, it, it's, it represents his authority and his power. And I, and I immediately begin thinking of temple imagery, that you're wearing these robes of righteousness. And of course, um, it's filled with angels, and these angels have wings, which <laughs> is rather beautiful to think about. <laughs> but when life seems to be so confining and difficult and challenging, just step back and think about heaven and think about entering into the presence of God and how would you feel? I was in a, um, years and years and years ago, we had a um, production when we used to do temple pageants. Okay. (laughs) And I was the girl, I was the young girl that was on the very, very top of this mountain when the Savior came down in 3rd Nephi. And I'm, uh, they told me, they told all of us, Get in whatever position you want to be in when you see the Savior, if the Savior were to come right now. And I'm the first one he greeted. I was at the top of the mountain. And um, Isaiah says, I'm unworthy. I, I need cleansing. And as a child in that role, I just reached my arms out and, and jumped. Um, <laughs> but I, now as an adult, 
I want Isaiah's cleansing. And I have felt the Lord's love a lot of times in my life, but I don't think I've ever felt it as strongly as when I have repented. And to feel that forgiveness, to feel the Lord's arms around you is such a sweet thing. And I hope Isaiah felt, felt it because he says in verse seven, thy sin is purged. You know, I, I hope he felt that unity. And that's when the Lord then says, whom shall I send? Not only is this the center of Isaiah's throne theophany, but shouldn't it be the center of our prayers? And sometimes I get my prayers all mixed up and I forget who's the master and who's the servant, you know, and I say, could you please do this, 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 you know? And I, I feel like this is such a great example to remind me on my knees, I need to say, I'm here to serve you. What can I do for you today? Rather than the other way around. Yeah, I, I love this. It's interesting raising kids coming up. Uh, I was watching a video from uh, President uh, Lund, uh, the general young men's president, and he was showing how he had memorized the young men's theme. theme. And I, I was so impressed, and I serve in my state young men's, and so I'm like, I'm gonna memorize this theme. And uh, I have a 12-year-old son, and you know, he's in junior high, and so I'm trying to like help him understand what it really means to yeah. to live the gospel and to be strong. And my first thought was, you need to memorize the young men's theme. The reason why is because it connects us to God. It shows us who we are. Mm. And I see that as we look at Isaiah, this whole idea of you have to always remember and understand who you are. What has President Nelson told us? You are sons and daughters of God, you are children of the covenant, and you are disciples of Jesus Christ. I think that's what Isaiah is trying to show us, having seen our day, is you need to understand who you are so that you can survive and progress. So I have a question about chapter 17. I think this is, Nephi talks about how, if you want to understand Isaiah, where he shares how, because of where he grew up, he, it allows him to understand Isaiah a little more. Yeah, the prophecy is eyeing of the Jews. Yes. That's right, that's right. And yes. he understands their, their ways, he understands you know, the regions round about. How can understanding some of those things help us understand, for example, what is happening in chapter 17 with war and, and, what the, the, and the message the Lord is trying to send? Well, first of all, you have to learn Hebrew to understand the name of his children. Okay, I'll, I'll get on that <laughs> so right he's, away. <laughs> he's, he's got those two boys that he names, these funny names. Look at verse three. The Lord said unto Isaiah, um, now go forth and take thy son, share Jehoshaphat. You know, this is an interesting name, but luckily we've got footnotes <laughs> okay. that tell us. And then there's Mahal or Shazbad is the other name, you know, but these names were given because they're going to fulfill the prophecies. And I love the fact that the lives of the prophets are types of Christ and their children become the fulfillment of those prophecies. So Nephi included it because he wanted us to look for Christ. Yes. And the messianic one here is chapter 17, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give unto you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall call his name Emmanuel. God, God with, us. with us. And I love the idea of God with us because Isaiah has just had an experience where he was with God. And now he's saying God can be with us and I think this is part of Tyndale's development of the word atonement, you know, at one moment. It's, it's God with us. And then, of course, yes. we have the beautiful life of Christ as God with us. Yeah. I think the message I get from chapter 17, at least, is that the Lord says, all of the things you're relying on, you're making an alliance, you're doing all these yeah. things. Verse two, he says, it's told the house of David saying, Syria is confederate mm -hmm. with Ephraim. So David was the tribe of Judah down there. Ephraim is the northern tribe. And northern tribe is making a deal with Syria to come, to defeat. come defeat the, the people in Judah. Yes, you can try to make all the alliances you want, but God is the one you got to rely on, Israel. You, even if you go to the most powerful nation on the earth, it's not going to protect you. And we live in a day of wars and rumors of wars, and the answer is repentance. Yes. And just this idea Trusting of God. this pull to get us to rely on something other than what matters most. And I love what President Nelson recently said, the answer is always Jesus. <laughs> always. <laughs> So uh, can I first just say, this is, this is so fun. I feel like I've learned so much and I'm learning so much and I feel this strong 
desire to continue to continue studying Isaiah yeah. with a greater passion. So thank you for what you've been adding to this conversation. Before we uh, close up, Lynn, I would just love to hear from you. What's one message from these Isaiah chapters that really has stood out to you and that has special meaning for you? Well, we haven't gotten to 18, and there's something here in chapter 18 okay. that I'd love to talk about. I mentioned that... Um, the temple is a huge focus for Isaiah. You know, his whole world is focused on the temple, but I really feel like it's not just the temple, it's coming into the presence of God. And in chapter 18, verse 14, he talks about Christ in a sense, um, as well as a temple, as if they were synonymous maybe. He shall be for a sanctuary. Now in the tabernacle and in the temple, the holy place and the holy of holies is called the sanctuary that Christ is also that sanctuary because you're coming into the presence of Christ. He shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. And some people are going to be stumbling and falling over him. That's verse 14 and 15. But in 16, he says, bind up the testimony, seal the law. You know, this is what is needed. There's all this destruction. I want to make sure that people are sealed. I want to make sure that the covenant, remember covenant and testimony are the same word. The, the covenant is sealed. And how do we bind up the covenant and seal the law? We go to the temple and make covenants or else we come through the waters of baptism, which has been around since the time of Adam. But he's saying in verse 17, I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob and I will look for him. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I would like to have Isaiah's motivation in my life. I will look for him. And sometimes it's like, where's Waldo? You have to look all over the yeah. place for Christ's hand in your day. <laughs> and other times he's front and center. And you say, I saw the Savior in my life today. And I want to share that with you. But this is to me such a temple focused mm -hmm. section. And the destruction can be all around us in the last days. But if we will make our covenants and if we leave behind the materialism of the bravery of our ornaments and hold to our temple covenants, we can have this blessing of seeing the presence of the Lord someday. That is beautiful, Lynn. Yeah. I love it. I, a thought I had was in verse 9 and 10. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and you shall be broken in pieces. You're talking about all these alliances that they're trying to get out there and find. You give ear to all far countries, gird yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, and it will come to naught. In verse 10, speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. And I, I think of the Savior. He talks about breaking the yoke and all of these things, of all of the oppressive things. But what does the Savior invite us into? He says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And take my, take my yoke, yoke upon, upon you. you. <laughs> For I'm, yeah. And if you think about that, when you see yoke and oxen, we know that they need to be about the same strength and size in order to effectively pull. And That's I, not I, the case for I, me well, and the Lord. <laughs> well, I, I see myself, you know, oh yeah, the Savior's so strong, and he says, okay, come. But what does that maybe tell us about ourselves? If the Savior says, I know who you are, yeah, that's and let's yoke together because yeah. I see the potential that you have. Mm -hmm. Let me loan you my strength yeah. because when we pull together, I know who you really are. Mm -hmm. You maybe cannot see that you belong in this yoke with me, but you do because you also are a child of the Most High God. You know, I, I hope the viewers watching can capture the, the joy and the enlightenment that comes from studying the scriptures and specifically the words of I, Isaiah. And that's because of your wonderful testimonies and, and the sharing of your experiences. Thank you both so much for being here and sharing your testimonies and your thoughts on the words of Isaiah. And for those watching at home, thank you for joining us for this discussion from 2 Nephi chapters 11 through 19. Visit byutv.org slash come follow up for more study and teaching resources. And join us next week as we study 2 Nephi chapters 20 through 25 and discuss more about Isaiah's prophecies and finding peace in Christ. Thank you for watching.